The very first sentence in Joseph Campbell's masterpiece, Myths of Light, reads as follows. Myths do not belong in the rational mind. Rather, they bubble up from deep in the wells of what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. I think what happens in our mythology here in the West is that the mythological archetypal symbols have come to be interpreted as facts. What old JC is trying to say here is that we take everything literally. Therefore, we consider myths to be false instead of symbolic. Symbology is a language all its own that can be understood by anyone with an open eye, despite any language barriers. While visiting my friend Mike and Katie, I noticed a statue of the head of Siddhartha mounted on his balcony. This is a head of the Buddha that we've all seen a thousand times, but for some reason it struck me in a new way. It was as if my eyes could now see the language that this head was silently speaking. I had already known that the oddball haircut represented snails. As myth has it that the Buddha Siddhartha was so still while sitting under that tree that snails found it to be a very pleasant and easy home. This caused me to realize the large ass ears in comparison to the mouth which was small. I think it goes without saying that this represented the Buddha's ability to listen before speaking. This led me to how large the eyes were. Eyes are unusually large for a human being, representing the ability to see I would suppose, but they are closed. I sat with that for a moment, pondering what could be the meaning of this. This question seemed to answer itself when I looked at the space between the eyes. And well, there is that tiny dot that we've all seen. Despite Siddhartha having incredible vision to see through all of the suffering and bullshit that caused him to sit under that tree, he decided to shut off his sharpened, dualistic eyes and instead chose to use the one in the center. This of course, as you know, represents the third eye or pineal gland in conjunction with the pituitary gland that fuels it, causing it to be a sort of transducer or a receiver of higher information. And none of these observations were particularly earth shattering, but it created a sense of unease within me. I began to realize that amongst all of this quote, love and light, and we are all one type slogans that are by all means true, but watered down and repeated like a broken record, these phrases are either too simple or just outright misunderstood. Either way, I got a strong feeling that something has been overlooked. I realized that I needed this symbology to be broken down in a language to better understand which, I mean, despite being impossible of course, might lead me to a more modern understanding of the symbology. Being born in today's age, it seems as if I needed something a little bit closer in time space to comprehend fully what I was looking at. But rereading the Tao Te Ching or the Upanishads and the Dhammapada or even Carl's unique take on Eastern philosophy was not going to cut it this time. I needed something rare but close to the source yet at the same time could speak to me in English. My thirst became completely quenched after discovering the missing works of Lao Tzu, a book of recorded conversations between a prince and Lao Tzu himself, an ancient and overlooked text called the Hua He Ching. While reading it, not not only was I perplexed at how this ancient manuscript has been so slept on, but I began to think how is this not front page news? Cause within the codex are symbolical breakdowns of modern day understandings like space time, quantum physics, and even clear as day predictions of the future. I was absolutely astounded by every passage. I would like to read some of my favorite portions of it here today, but before we get to that, I can't ignore the synchronicity that struck right Right after this realization. After peering at Siddhartha's head, I went to open my phone to take a picture and I saw an email from one of you. An email from a YouTuber that goes by the name Joey Bible. The email began with a disclaimer that he didn't even really know why he was sending this information, but he felt like it'd be helpful to the channel. Unbelievably so, the email went on to list several misconceptions about how we view Siddhartha and non-dual thinking in general. For example, Siddhartha Siddhartha is almost always depicted with several serpents coming up from behind his head and 
then forming an umbrella above his entire body. Like the face of Tutankhamun with birds and serpents coming from his forehead, I assumed that this was a symbol for Kundalini, although it'd be a bit unconventional, considering that the Kundalini has always been depicted as twin serpents, two and not sevenfold. Joey pointed out that what was actually happening here was called Muka Linda. As the Buddha sat under the tree, heaven darkened for seven days and there were terrible storms on earth. The serpent beings that I mistook for Kundalini were in fact Naga Raja, a species known as the Nagas, or as we have seen on this channel several times, anthropomorphic reptiles. The Nagas, like many, many other reptilian creatures in mythology, are said to be semi-divine humanoid serpent beings that come from the underworld. I was dumbstruck. I realized that the part I had been missing all along was obvious. The mountain is high because the valley is low. You see, all this talk about love and light and all is one kind of derailed me from seeing this obvious missing piece in the mythology of the Buddha. That missing piece was darkness. But why would a reptilian humanoid from the underworld, that is to say the fight or flight portion of our brain, have anything to do with protecting Siddhartha during his meditation? Why would a creature of darkness bother to help Siddhartha in his quest to end all suffering on earth? These questions, of course, cannot be answered with mouth noises, so come with me while we turn our attention to the beautifully illuminated world of symbols and allegory. Joseph Campbell has stated that mythology is composed by poets out of their insights and realizations. Mythologies are not invented, they are found. You can no more tell us what your dream is going to be tonight than we can invent a new myth. Myths come from our essential experience, and, end quote. We know that the Brahma is said to be seated on a lotus. When he closes his eyes, worlds come into existence, including our own, and when he opens his eyes, everything ceases to be, indicating that we are living in within his dream. If we connect that to an ancient fable called the humbling of Indra, it indicates that all of the galaxies in space are each a single lotus, each one with its own Brahma. This leads me on a wild speculation about the nature of our reality in relation to black holes, as it is hypothesized that each galaxy has a gigantic black hole at its center. This could very well be a video on its own, but let's keep on point here to uh, to answer our initial question. The lotus flower or rose in the West is often associated with the area of the heart. Myth has it that the Buddha was born from his mother's side, being born from the heart chakra as opposed to his mother's genitalia, which resides at the pelvis region, the lower chakras, leaving the mother's heart exposed. This reminds me of the Christian allegory of Eve being made from the rib cage of man. Man being the scum of the earth gave life from his heart center for the sake of woman. With his rib cage now removed, his heart is now exposed particularly to his counterpart being a woman. This does not surprise me at all, considering I think that men everywhere will agree that their greatest weakness is in fact, well, yeah. I, oh, we've all been there. The lotus flower and its beauty arises from the mud and the filth from the bottom of a pond, as parallel to the rose symbol in the west, which, despite being equally as beautiful, has thorns towards its base. In both cases, we are not able to have beauty at the top without something more heinous at the bottom. The name of the heart chakra is an interesting and unexpected translation, being called the Anatta. The Anahata translates to no impact. When looking into what this term no impact is alluding to, I found that two things, dual things, colliding is what makes sound or cymatics. By indicating no impact, we are led to a paradox that is the question, what is the sound not made by two things colliding? Einstein made it clear that energy and mass are the same thing. So adverse to that is this so-called not sound. 
Well, in the tradition of Zen, taking dual aspects and uniting them into one seems to refer to the sound of one thing, one primordial thing, the sound that we call the Om. In the West, it is referred to as Logos, or the word. Om is often spelled A-U-M by the original patriarchs. The A is representing the wakeful state that is your primary consciousness, perceiving all that is not you. The U represents the dream state. You are aware and you can see, but only things that come from within, hence you. The M represents dreamless sleep, or in other words, the very thing that we can not describe with words. This little piece of symbology is fun considering that the M sound is indeed the sound of the mouth closing. Mm, therefore, no speech. I mean, uh, there really are no accidents here. To chant this sacred sound during meditation is intended to unite all three of these elements together. And that, of course, alludes us to the Western idea of the Holy Trinity. The Star of David has a triangle pointing up and a triangle pointing down. This obvious symbol of the old adage, as above, so below, seems to be the earth reaching up to heaven, meanwhile, heaven reaching down to earth. Parallel to the Star of David, in the east, there is the symbol of the Buddha's footprints, each with repeated circles within the center of them, kind of like uh, the Hamza symbol that we're uh, familiar with. These circles that represented in a myriad of mandalas all over the world is engraved in the center of each foot. So despite being divine beings, much like the lotus in the mud and the Rosicrucian heart wielding thorns, these divine beings still have feet with dirt on them. And with our hands, or singular eye, as represented in the Hamza symbol, we are able to make contact with the divine. But we're limited to the feet, as indeed we are here within the black cube on Earth. And of course, I always seem to come back to Carl on a lot of these things, but I can't ignore his wisdom that often appears in his one-liners like... The reason man cannot find God is because he is not looking low enough. I can't help but be inspired by how completely different people from completely different cultures always seem to come to similar conclusions after years of introspection. This reminds me of a lesser used depiction of the Buddha symbol. He is often seen seated on a lotus, of course, but there are many depictions of him with one hand or one finger gently touching the ground. This is his spot, and it is your spot as well, right here, right now, right where you're sitting. In a way, you don't have to leave. You are already on the ground. So I'm already standing on the ground. Shut up. I can sing on my own show if I want to. That's a great song, by the way. This is called uh, Bumi Parsha. And a side note, I personally love this depiction of lightly touching the ground. It's like an effortless just boop of the hand. And it's just so on point and relaxed. It is not forcing anything, but instead simply kind of invites you in for a cup of tea. This symbol for grounding simply means that he is not moved by desire or fear, but only by Dharma, that is his social duties, as we all have. And that balance between the esoteric and our everyday social duties can be acquired here very simply in, in this allegory. His hand gently touching the ground doesn't always mean to sit still, but instead to carry that stillness with you and into your social duties that is to say, your own dharma. Side note, it's kind of funny how the word social and duties are put together so easily. <laughs> and if you don't get that joke, just go ask a fifth grader to translate it for you. Let's not get confused about this freedom from desire. This in no way means to be ignorant of attachment, suffering, and sexual desire. As we know that the allegory of the Buddha understood all too well the nature of pain and suffering, as well as the temptation of sexual desires, as opposed to ignorance of it. It simply means to understand these parts of ourselves and then to transcend them. Very tricky for some of you players out there, uh, but certainly a lot easier for people who are virgins, such as myself. Baby Buddha, uh, we can call him the BB, 
took seven steps representing the seven chakras, and then his hands moved into an all too familiar formation. His right hand pointed to the heavens and his left hand pointed downward. This has been seen in so many cultures that I can't even begin to list them here. One of my favorites is the Da Vinci painting of the Christ pointing to the heavens with a hand gesture that seems to be just absolutely just beyond gentle and relaxed. His hand is not stern or tightened up in any way, but just instead an effortless connecting with the divine while at the same time acknowledging his understanding of the more hellish worlds below. And surprising or not, this same symbol depicted by the Christ is also depicted by the Baphomet. However, the hand gestures here seem to be more intense, more rigid, and this almost seems to remind me of the difference between a good trip and a bad trip, whereas I, both are necessary in the case of Gnosis and true gnosis. Within the Mahayana, there is an allegory of a ferry boat that is used to cross a river. This river representing turmoil can be crossed to a new place of no pain and no suffering, but at the same time, well, no worldly pleasures. But just like any ferry boat, there is of course a toll to be paid. This toll is to give up all ideals, belief systems, and attachments, basically moving from samsara to nirvana. That wasn't scripted. What? Don't judge me. I'm just saying that sometimes regular bands and regular artists are deified because of their death. I just, just... You'll notice that if I get killed for making these videos, I'll probably be remembered in a good light. All right, you don't want to hear about that. All right. This ferry boat represents the esoteric teachings while the river seems to represent the chaos of the world. And ironically enough, within the Mahayana, when the passengers reach the yonder shore, they can't help but wonder at that time and place what the prior shore looks like. They might now ask themselves, I wonder what's going on in the world of samsara. I wonder what's going on in the mud now that I'm sitting atop the lotus, so to speak. And in a way, the old adage rings out out still that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I, a paradox that we all get f***ed with on a daily basis. Myths, allegories, and symbols are a streamline of thoughts throughout generations that are unobstructed, unmolested, and uncensored by those who consider themselves overlords of the world. All of our current information is sanitized by an, uh, an authoritative figure due to his own bias and belief system, or in, in most cases, control systems, as we learned in the previous video before this one. Uh, systems of, of control. This censorship of information cannot be done with mythology. Mythology, of course, being that central knowing point within all of us that cannot be touched by any singular influence. It is carried in the hearts of mankind. You can ignore it all you want, but it's still going to pop up in your movies and in your literature and within the obstacles of your everyday life. So we might want to start paying attention. Speaking of paying attention to the lesser known wisdom of the world, let's jump in as promised to the wise words buried within the Hua He Ching. Let's be clear about something. There is no definitive proof that this text was written based on the words of Lao Tzu himself. Much like the work of William Shakespeare, who never actually existed, this text seems to be most likely an amalgamation of many Zen masters who well understood the teachings of Lao Tzu. Thus, like I was looking for in the first place, a connection between something that is too ancient for my modern brain to comprehend and a verbal language that seems to light a candle in the direction of these teachings to our current cultural eyes in our modern society. Just like the Upanishads here, uh, this text is not a manuscript, but instead a conversation between a teacher and a student, that student being a prince, ironically enough. Lao Tzu had no social patriarchy whatsoever. He was just simply the wisest man. He did not crave power in any way, shape, or form. He wasn't a king. He wasn't a politician, but they all sought him out especially when he was leaving for the mountains. They chased him down. They would, they didn't want him to leave. So in a way, and I do mean loosely speaking, it is as if the actual anonymous authors of this text might have been channeling the message of Lao Tzu from within their own collected consciousness. 
So I'm going to start here. Kind prince, said the master. Suppose a person cuts himself loose from being fooled by the senses. Can he then become attached to the fruit of his enlightenment? This is a question posed by Lao Tzu to test his student. The student replied, no venerable teacher. The one who has succeeded in cutting himself loose from attachment to the senses cannot then fasten himself to what he has attained. To do so would be to return to the enslavement of the senses and the reign of the ego would ruin what he had attained. And this reminds me of the, uh, the humbling of Indra, where once the Indra acknowledges how powerful he is, down he goes within that wheel of samsara to become a row of ants. Kind Prince, the subtle body of the Universal One is omnipresent, and it is present itself when all speech has been exhausted and the mind has been stripped away. When the highest sincerity is achieved, the subtle cosmic body of the Universal One responds. Then, wise Prince, the Universal One can be seen even in what appears to be plain, simple, and ordinary. Kind of like what Ramdas said about if you're in a town where you're complaining that there's no spiritual people, well, look a little bit closer because you've missed the point. Every one of these people, including uh, the most ignorant comments on YouTube, are in fact fractals of this primordial first cause. This next section just straight up gave me diarrhea in a mental way. Uh, an in intellectual diarrhea. It seems to gracefully summarize the idea of quantum physics and non-locality. The idea that the subatomic particles within us are worlds within us, as we too are its world, and that our entire solar system seems to be also just particles within an unimaginably larger sentient being. Wise Prince, the individual body is the cosmic body. The small particle, which I referred to before, is associated with the individual body. When the world diversifies itself into small particles, it is like the cosmic body appearing as the individual body. Just as the small particles gather, comprising the vast world, the individual actualizes the cosmic body. The cosmic body must not be thought of as something separate from the whole. While the world may not be small particles, it could be traced back to small particles. The cosmic body may be comprehended as the vast and profound universe, but it is not observable in physical terms. It is beyond reach, yet at the same time it is also within reach. Mm. The relationship between the world and the small particles is somewhat similar to the relationship between a flower and a mirror which reflects it. Both reflect each other, neither can be held as the substance. The relationship between the cosmic body and the individual body is something like the relationship between the moon and its reflection on a lake. One seems to be the real thing and the other is just a reflection, but even the moon is only reflecting the light of the sun. The sun is not the final source either. There is nothing substantial which is final. When the small particles take on some configuration, they may appear solid and fixed. However, they are neither solidly formed nor perpetually changing. It seems true that the world really exists in time and space, but it is merely a transient conjoint event in this place and time. It also seems true that the individual body really exists in time and space, but it too is merely a transient. Even the structure of time and space themselves is not real, but is only a conceptual creation. Um, I mean, maybe theoretical physicists of today should pick up this book and realize that they've got a long way to go. Speaking of that passage, a friend of mine and the drummer of Sidereal once half jokingly said to me, I wonder if our entire solar system is just an atom existing within the nutsack of some dude working at Quiznos. And it, it sounds silly and almost like a stoner thought, right? But if you go to Quiznos and see the guy making sandwiches, you can check his nutsack for yourself and clearly see that it is made out of atoms. Uh, um, but, uh, don't do that. Man, uh, how ironic would it be if... <laughs> All these videos I've done railing against the government and exposing CIA documents don't get me demonetized, but that dumbass comment does. I'll get canceled for this video and shot in the head for the others, and, uh, and it'll be an honor. 
The text goes on here, taking on the balance of suffering versus pleasure and one's own happiness versus the responsibility to others, dharma or social duties. Venerable teacher, is an individual responsible for whether his life is pleasant or unpleasant? Is he also responsible for the lives of others? The response of Lao Tzu goes as such. Kind prince, after one takes form as an individual entity, suffering and enjoyment continue throughout many lifetimes and even during the subtle intermission between lives. Oh, I thought I looked the bardo. Actually, to suffer and enjoy seems to be the destiny of an individual, but its extent is determined by the way in which one subjectively forms one's energy, consciously and unconsciously. And don't make me break out the Carl Jung charts again. I've been driving those home, but you got it. With regard to whether a person is responsible for the lives of others, it is not a question of responsibility, but of how one manifests one energy. We notice there that he doesn't directly answer the question, which uh, can be perplexing until you study the text. Maybe read it a few other times, uh, and by all means, listen to it a few other times and boost my algorithm if you'd like. But in conjunction with the rest of the text, this non-answer to the question almost seems to make more sense than directly answering a question that essentially can't be answered. There are even lyrics within this codex. While I'm uncertain that anyone knows how the melody goes, and if you do, please enlighten me on that, the words are without a doubt some of the most critical I've ever put eyes on. This song that Lao Tzu supposedly sings, and also keep this is in reference to those who are in power, what we would call politicians of today. They make moves that disturb the world. The wise and old ones sit still and watch the chess games of the foolish. All the changes in the world are displayed upon the chessboard. This goes to show how old chess is. Uh, that's something I would kind of like to look into. Victory and defeat are decided by the subtle elements behind the moves. It can clearly be seen by the wise. The wise remain quiet and watch. The foolish gods only knew it. There is perfect originalness before any moves are made. Reminds me of our pool table example in uh, a few videos back, uh, the, the uh, Zen and the Inner Flame, which this is kind of a part two of, but that pool table uh, analogy, the ones who are not in the chessboard, but the players, thus you holding the cue stick and not being one of the balls, especially one of the balls inside the nutsack of the guy at Quiznos. Once I, I read this line, I literally had to put the book down and I just sat quietly for about, I, I'm not sure how much amount of time, but this is thousands of years before Carl Jung was even born. Here we go. And it's a one line. If a person looks for the path outside himself, he will find his shadow. I just wanted to read it again. If a person looks for the path outside of himself, he will find his own shadow. I mean, obviously, literally, that is the case. But, of course, none of this is literal. And that shadow is there if we don't pay attention to what is within us. All right, so here's where we're going to start to get really intense. Check out this section that seems to predict the future. Venerable teacher, will people of the future generations during the age of confusion be able to understand such truth? Response, kind prince, in the future age of confusion, people will create many obstacles to knowing the simple truth and hold fast to their own blindness and falsehoods. They will persuade others to follow them and will persecute unbelievers and even start wars against them. Kind Prince, the one who searches for the truth loses it. Oh. The one who wishes to hold the truth causes it to slip away from him. Oh God, it hurts so bad. Because one departs from his own nature to search for something external. He overlooks the truth of his own being. To be is to be true. The muchness and suchness of truth is included in this very second. If you miss the truth of this moment, a thousand galloping horses cannot catch up with it. I can't help but be reminded of uh, the end of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the very last line in the movie when he says, uh, life moves pretty quick. If you don't stop and look around every once in a while, you, you just might miss it.
which that entire movie, by the way, is much like Fight Club, an actual psychological parable. It's not a it's not a fun comedy movie. It is that on the surface, but if you ever get a chance after understanding symbology, watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off knowing that they are the same person and the movie becomes an entire another uh, another trip. Continuing to predict the future here, venerable teacher, should this scripture be called the thorough emancipation of the mind, although in truth there is no mind to emancipate, or should it be called the integration of the universal mind? It ended up becoming called the Hua Ching, but will the general public in the time of confusion be able to benefit from such high instructions? Will it even be powerful enough to lead sensitive individuals out of darkness? And the response, kind prince, asked the master, will the people of the future be less intelligent? I'll let you have your answer first. Student's response, venerable teacher, replied the prince. I think people of the future will be more intelligent, so I do not understand why there will be more trouble in the future. Although life will be more abundant, people will be more unhappy. Why is this so? Wise prince, replied the master. It will be from misuse and partial development of intelligence that a time of confusion will arise and grow progressively worse. People will lose their appreciation for a healthy natural life of plainness after being attracted to and entrapped by all kinds of accumulated bad habits. Slavery will pervade human life and all human relationships under different names and reasons. If one is not the slave of social development, he will be the slave of all kinds of emotional entrapment. The forms of slavery are many. Most people become slaves to natural demands, fashionable luxuries, social power, artificial religion or ideology, destiny, and most of all, psychological excuses. And uh, just a quick side note, a lot of denominational religions depict the Buddha and Lao Tzu and these other figures to be false idols when they say clearly in their own texts that they are neither deities or to be worshipped and in fact say the same thing that fundamental Christians do not to worship false idols yet somehow they're they're called false idols that's a uh, perplexity to me of uh, I think a bit of ignorance that should be uh, gently corrected creating unprecedented calamity on a large scale Kind Prince, the universal way will be available at all times and places for the problems of individuals and the world. It'll, it'll be available to you, despite the chaos and the circus. There will be great people who awaken during the era of great confusion and darkness. <laughs> Through a vast social renaissance, the awakening of the universal divine nature within people will be reached. Its true foundation rests on the people who will achieve themselves through individual emancipation and self-cultivation. This cultivation, of course, being very akin to uh, two or three videos now endorsing the idea of sacrifice. Uh, Self-cultivation seems to be the fine-tuning of oneself at the expense of worldly pleasures and desires and uh, attachments. This next particular passage seems to point us directly to some kind of salvation to our initial question at the beginning of this video. That is, what does darkness have to do with the idea of Buddhahood? The secret of immortal cultivation and the harmonious universe is expressed in the Tai Chi symbol. Everything takes something from something else. The basic structure of the universe that is generally recognized as time and space is not something solid. Time and space can change and dissolve, but the existence of a being or a thing does not rely on the framework of time and space. Time and space have no self-nature. They are only accessories of an event. Supernatural beings extend their life force freely to the lives of form and no form, and at the the same time keep themselves unformed and supernatural. These two realities can be discussed separately, but both sides belong to the same substance of the great one universal life. In the process of human evolution, and we have an ancient text that just used the word, I'm not endorsing evolution, but it's in here. 
In the process of human evolution, the universal truth is reached by one who is whole and who is not entrapped by natural or supernatural phenomenon. And I mean, uh, where, where's Carl again? And this uh, definitely teeters on that fine line between the action of reading being relaxing and soothing versus it causing you to lose sleep at night. But right here, like a form of everything text, why darkness is as important as light, how to live, and more importantly, why to live. This summarization is so keen that it almost makes me feel like the reason the text is rare is because of how good it is. This text is so damn spot on and poignant and clear that it almost leads the reader to instant liberation or at least temporary liberation. And we all know that these types of wisdoms, how they're treated in our society today, they get buried. They get buried in, in this kind of a strip mall style metaphysics, this kind of heaping pile of aesthetic that has to be sifted through in order to find this diamond in the rough. The last portion I'll read here, the integral cultivation of the immortal achievement must be built on a firm foundation of virtue. The opportunity to learn and practice such cultivation is heaven's reward to those who are truly virtuous. This means not to be virtuous by helping a fish from drowning by putting him in a tree, but to actually cultivate humility and within kind action, such as planting a tree for future generations. All human beings are the descendants of the original spiritual inhabitants of this world many, many eons ago. Let me read that one more time. All human beings are the descendants of the original spiritual inhabitants of this world many, many eons ago, or ions if for you fans of Jung. But people have deviated from the accurate awareness of the divine nature of life and have lost the qualities of these angelic beings. Is this Atlantis? Is this pre-Atlantis? Is this something that we can't, is it, is it an allegory? Like, it goes on. Only those who have restored the angelic qualities of their being and who have already actualized the universal way may be instructed in the method used by the angels to enhance and integrate their energy in order to become immortal divine beings. This might remind us of the mysteries of, uh, of Eleusis. Oh, you all remember Plato going off to the, you know, the spot the final paragraph in this section for such teachers reside in the subtle divine realm or in seclusion where they have an ordinary appearance and lead an ordinary life and this of course in our last video on zen reminds me of the final step of riding the ox home which is returning to the marketplace unadorned dirty with tattered rags as a garment yet just showing up into the marketplace old withered trees come into bloom it's a vibe it's fearlessness it's certainty and it's heart chakra that heart chakra existing between the subtle realms and the lower chakras that middle point where the Buddha was born in the first place and where Adam gave birth to Eve. I could go on and on this particular book, but I don't want to end up just straight up reading to you like it's a bedtime story. Although it would be my pleasure to do so though. I'll tuck you in baby birds. And encourage you to get a copy of this book, the uh, Hua He Ching. And once again, would like to remind you that this is not a paid endorsement. I simply would like you, the viewer, to get the best of the best when it comes to these teachings. Sifting through of all this strip mall style fluff and with dirty hands come up and bring you to the surface these almost hidden pieces of wisdom still remains within this ancient text the answer to the question that we had in the original portion of this video the reason that darkness is an essential part of zen in the first place a teaching that just will not fit into our human language so we have no other choice but to look at it with our eyes or if you were to ask the buddha to do so we would have to look at it with our eye and despite being overused and watered down quite frankly this symbol is that which represents the answer to that huge question here it is plain as day there i'm gonna put a symbol up i'm not pointing to my computer here it is the symbol 
there'll be something on the screen there. To end this video, I feel like the most suitable thing to do would be to summarize this non-thing called Zen the best way I can. So to put it simply, Zen is actually a form of 